All right. Mm, happy day today. Let's press on. Second thing that comes when we're saved, good news. Yeah, good news. The second thing that comes is the mystical union. The mystical union. And what we mean by the mystical union is the fact that Christ now indwells you. And if Christ is indwelling you, well, the whole Trinity is. And we learned already from Chemnitz that this way of Christ being present is different than the way that Christ is present in the tree, or the way that Christ is present in the Lord's Supper, or the way that he was present in the boat with the disciples. This mystical union means that through faith, Christ actually indwells you. And this is also St. Paul. Who's doing the good things that happen that I do? Christ within, exactly, not me. Christ within is doing them. And so Christ gets all the credit. And yet I'm responsible for doing them. So we're back to that tension again, that reality. So the mystical union. Now, Pieper, interestingly, says, you know what? The mystical union is tremendously comforting. Yes, it is. Gospel. So your child is afraid at night. There's snakes under the bed. And there's a monster in the closet. And so what do you tell them? Jesus is with you. It's all right. He's in your heart. You're okay. Well, that's nice. That's good. All right, so then the next night, you tell the same child, remember, Jesus lives in your heart. When the babysitter comes tonight, don't you screw up. Is that law or gospel? <laughs> so, Pieper says the mystical union has a gospel implication. Whew, God's always with me. And a law implication. God's in you. Why are you messing around? And then he quotes scripture to back him up. You got St. Paul's great thing. Why do you unite your body with a whore when you're the body of Christ. How would you join Christ to a prostitute? What are you doing? That's law, guys. And so we like to think, oh, mystical union. That's all gospel, man. That's all good. But St. Paul is not afraid to use it in a law way. Remember, Christ is living in you. Don't mess up. See, the same thing goes with God's presence. So you tell your children, God's watching. Oh, that's comforting. God's always watching me. God's watching. Oh, yeah, he is. It works both ways. And it's kind of nice to see how this plays out. Also, it's important to recognize, this is, I want to talk about this just a little bit. We're not talking here about this thing called theosis. And I want you to know about this word. You need to learn it somewhere along the way. Theosis is a teaching in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And theosis is even how they understand justification. Theosis means um, divinization. It's the best translation of it. In other words, becoming God. And some people say, oh, that's like the Mormon thing. Well, you can talk to Romney about that. Um, I guess the president's one way along the step towards that. Um, but no, that's not exactly the same thing. The theosis is the idea of this kind of oneness with God. But the mystical union is not the same thing as theosis. And Pieper gets at this when he says, um, point C on 409, it is not a pantheistic transformation of the substance of the Christians into the substance of God. And theosis almost starts to talk this way, that you are sort of just lost in the Godhead, which starts to sound very Hindu monistic sort of thing. And that's not good. It's the whole thing about, you know, the drop of water returning to the ocean. Ah, back where he belongs. And yet, what happens to the drop? Gone no longer has its own existence. And this is not what we get from Christian truth. Christian truth says God made you the unique individual you are. You are you forever. And the problem with theosis is it starts to chip away at the individuality of the individual Christian creation of God. It gets lost. So the mystical union is not the same thing as a theosis. The mystical union is Christ indwelling me, a human being, and I stay the human being that I am. I don't become God. And God doesn't sort of, sort of, just kind of like swallow me up into some kind of new thing. That's not what we're looking for here. Joel. And isn't this, he doesn't bring this up here, but isn't this closely related to how we understand then the kingdom of God being here among us, in us, that kind of stuff? Well, I see, that's a very interesting discussion. You know, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Um, we'll talk about that in Systems 4 a little bit more. My understanding of the kingdom of God is in your midst is that Jesus is talking about himself and not even about the indwelling. That would be a different kind of animal, I think. That's how I read it. Not everybody agrees with me on that, but that's how I would read that. All right. We've talked in here about um, Fides. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Micah. The Theosa thing we're talking about, is yeah. that what the Finnish school is keeping? Yes. Up? Yes. There is this thing called the Finnish school of Luther interpretation. Manerima and a few other guys who follow this. Dr. Schumacher wrote in his dissertation against this, and he's on the money. But there are some who would say, Luther taught this. And the Finnish school, a 20th century kind of bunch of theologians, were suggesting that they found this in Luther. Um, I disagree with this. Dr. Schumacher disagrees with this. And we would say, no, this is getting Luther wrong. And so that's the same, I think. Yes, Gino. 
the Martin, when the Luther said justification, it's a, it means uh, the God realized uh, his, his uh, close of righteousness. Yes. Inner person is uh, it's still black, mm -hmm. but uh, we wear uh, his righteousness. We wear his righteousness. Oh, we're still sinners, but we have Christ's righteousness covering us. Mystical union, when we say God dwell in us, so but that's why the Melanchthon said this, the righteousness is just declaring, not making. It's, but right. see, we're not denying this. The mystical union is getting at the idea that Christ does indwell me, and empowers me and equips me. And there is that. We don't deny that. We tend not to put a big focus on that, but it's part of it. So in other words, there is room for this. You're right. The main emphasis you're going to get is always the forensic, God simply declares it. But there's also the aspect of Christ does certainly indwell me, and he empowers me to live a new way. That, that means, it relate, that means uh, God, the justification is making us righteous? It, that's not the primary focus, but it does do that, yes. And this is, see, that's where, that's where you start talking about how sanctification really is sort of the um, putting into action of justification. And so the idea of sanative, we would really equate more with sanctification, the finishing off, the bringing to completion, the um, completion of what God has started in your salvation. Okay? All right. Third point that comes from this is page 410. Faith um, in the forgiveness of sins has given a new life and sanctification of good works. So this is kind of picking up on what Gino's already talking about is this new life of obedience and good works. So will you live a new life? Yeah. This is St. Paul. You're a new creation. Live a new way. This is the expectation. So justification produces this. This is part of that nexus indivulsus we already talked about, the insoluble connection between justification and the life that we live afterwards. So this comes out of this. So good works will happen. And we disagree with then with the idea of the fides formata caritatis. I already talked about that in here, right? Didn't I? Faith having been formed by love, right? And so we reject that. And so but we don't, while we say that faith is not formed by love, but faith is active in love. That's the distinction Luther liked to make. So faith isn't formed or finished by love, but it's active in love. Josh. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the GW? Good words. words. George Washington. <laughs> the bridge. No, that would be G GQ. Good question. The bridge. Oh, George Washington? Mm, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, that bridge. Okay. I thought he was a person. All right. Good. Fourth point that comes is membership in the church. So once you come to faith, you are a member of the church, whether you want to be or not. You've got brothers and sisters, and you have a new Lord and a new Father, and you are a member of the church. And this is a, one of the results of faith and the, all the comfort that comes with this. And then finally, the result of being justified is the promise of eternal bliss, or in other words, participation in the eschatological fulfillment at the end of time, or as some people like to call it, heaven, but um, better the eschatological fulfillment. And Peter even calls it eternal bliss here. The final consequence is eternal bliss. So we have God's putting us back where we belong and then participating with him at the restoration of all things. All right, then on 415, Peter gets into a discussion again about election a little bit, and he makes the point here very strongly that anytime you talk about election, always needs to be in the context of faith and what God has done for us. He revisits the crux tale of Gorham. We've been there, so we don't need to do that again. And that brings us to the end of the first section. Any other questions there? Yeah. Um, with point four, membership in the church, what about the uh, modern age people that argue, oh, I don't want to be a part of the establishment or yeah, yeah, things yeah. of that? Um, how do you bring up the idea that just by the fact that you do believe? Um, this is a good point. Um, there is this tent, this kind of thing about postmoderns, millennials, Gen X's and Y's don't like membership. Membership's passe. We're past this. Um, I'm not ready to throw in the towel on this yet. Um, I would say that you are part of the body of Christ. And you might use the term membership or whatever. And there's the reality is you are part of the body of Christ, like it or not. And I think that we need to teach people this. Um, on the other side of this, and this is really not the question you're asking, but I want to mention this anyway. The whole thing about, well, you know, membership. We shouldn't be pressing that so hard anymore. I'm not ready to say that. I think the membership, actually joining a congregation, is making a commitment to a place, and it's kind of important to do that. And I don't think very much, honestly, of churches that are increasingly saying, hey, you don't really have to join, just be part of us. To me, that's kind of like shacking up instead of getting married. It amounts to the same thing. 
because you're, I'll be part of you as long as I like, and when I don't like it, guess what? I'm out of here, and you have no you know, connections, and that's true. Whereas if you become a member, you're actually putting, you're putting a stake down. I'm part of you, and from now on, you hold me accountable, I hold you accountable, that's how we are. And see, that's why I think we need to, I think we need to revitalize the discussion of membership and not let it go, not give it up. And we need to um, retrieve this again and stress that you're part of the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is always, always concretized in the individual congregation, unless you're in a, you know, kind of a, you're in a prison somewhere and you can't be part of the body or whatever. There's extenuating circumstances. But otherwise, if you are a member of the body of Christ, you will always seek out other Christians, which means you will always identify the congregation, and you should. Um, we'll stress this again in later classes, but in my opinion, and I would, Peeper's with me on this, and there are others, membership is not optional. Not optional. You need to be joined to a congregation. It's your responsibility. All right? Good. Faith is the next topic then. And we're talking about faith as a subset of the discussion of soteriology and how faith works. Now, the whole thing with faith we need to stress is the point, we've said this before, is not faith as much as it is the object of faith. And that's why when people say things like, wow, those Jehovah's Witnesses are so sincere. Wow, they really have faith. I just want to gag. Big deal. And the people, oh, I really admire their faith. No, don't admire their faith. Faith is no big deal. That's just a human emotion. What matters is the object. What's that faith hanging on to? And if their object is they're having faith in their own self-righteousness, what, what's there to like? Or their faith is in some idol, what's the point of that? So the object is the crucial thing. So when we talk about faith saves, it's not the faith. It's the object. That's the point. But faith, of course, is the thing that grabs on and takes hold of that object. So that's why faith becomes a necessary component in this whole discussion. Faith is critical, but it's not the faith per se. Faith is just this hanging on. It's what it hangs on to, Christ. That's, that's the source of the salvation. You get the distinction here with me on this? All right. Now, Another thing we need to hit real quickly here before we get too far is something he talks about in the intervening pages you did not have to read, and that's the distinction between fides qua creditur and fides quae creditur. You guys familiar with this? Heard this before? Okay. Now, this is the distinction between the faith that is believing and the faith which is believed. All right? And here's how this works out. Fides qua creditor is the faith that is believing. That's you personally actually saying, I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins and he rose again for me. I believe this. That faith is your fides qua creditor, the faith that is believing. Faith is hanging on. This is what creates salvation. This is what gives you the relationship of faith. And this is what we're talking about over here. All the results of this stuff, that's fides qua creditor. Fides quae creditur, with the E, is the faith that is believed, the content of what you're hanging on to. So when we talk about the Christian faith has many discrete doctrines, well, what are we talking about faith there? It's fides quae. And the way to keep these straight, here's my suggestion. I used to get these mixed up all the time, and I gave myself a little mnemonic. The E on fides quae reminds me that that is everything that we believe everything that we believe. And so then I don't get it mixed up anymore. So fides qua, everything we believe, that's the stuff. That's the contents. And the fides qua, that's the hanging on. That's the actual faith that saves and justifies. So when we're talking in our class here about the Christian faith, which one is it? Fides qua or fides qua? Fides qua, almost exclusively. But now we're going to talk about the fides qua. And that's what we're talking about now. We're talking about this faith that does this believing. So that's the discussion now, the fides qua. All right, <clears throat> page 424, we already talked about this earlier, but this is important. A person may have the fides justificans and salvans, in other words, faith that justifies and saves, though he is ignorant of certain parts of Scripture and even a weakness errors in certain doctrines of Scripture. So is it possible to have somebody who actually has true saving faith, fides qua, but have some of his fides qua messed up? Yeah, it's true. 
You can have that. And just because somebody is an orthodox believer in Christ, believes in it, doesn't mean he's orthodox in all of his profession of faith. So you can think about friends you have who are in heterodox churches who are truly saved, but they've got their wrong doctrine. That's what we're talking about. On the other hand, the corollary has to be also stressed that anybody who is a truly orthodox teacher of the faith must have his fides qua straight. Must. And this is interesting. It's not just me or people saying this, but even people like um, Stanley Hauerwas and others have made this statement that a person who is claiming to do Christian theology who is not himself a follower of Christ and a member of Christ's church has no right to do theology and cannot. He's, he's, he's basically excluded. And this is, I think, this is important. It's because you get this now. I, you create, I've read theologians who will say, I never go to church anymore, or I'm not part of a body. Well, you shouldn't be doing theology. You have no business. None. You're, you're disqualified. That's the point here. All right. Good. Pressing forward. Now, Peter starts giving us this list, and he's going to talk about several um, appellations he's going to put onto fides. So fides is the term in Latin for faith, and he's going to talk about several different things we want to think about here. And the first one is fides cordis. And this just means faith in the heart. Or actually, he uses fiducia cordis here, okay, the other form of this. So fiducia cordis, which is the faith of the heart. And what he's trying to stress here is that faith is something that you do in yourself. It's the actual trusting. And that's the real emphasis here, is the trusting. The personal aspect will come later. But the point here now is this kind of a heart that trusts. The heart that is trusting. This is trying to overcome one of the teachings that you'll get from Rome that says, well, faith is merely the intellectual knowledge. And so you have this distinction between the intellectual knowledge and then the assent and then the um, confidence or the trust. Rome would say this is a progression. The first one is faith and the other two grow from that. We say, no, all three together are faith. You can see how this works out. Intellectual uh, uh, knowledge would say, Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again. Can you know that without being a Christian? Yeah, yeah Satan knows that. Jesus Christ lived, died, rose again? Sure. Well, so maybe I say, all right, I know the story that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again, but I don't think it really happened. So now I've rejected, I have intellectual knowledge. I know about the story, but I haven't agreed with it. Well, now maybe I can go aside and say, yep, I know that story, and I think it happened. So I assent to it. I agree. It happened. Is that faith? Not yet. Just knowing it happened and agreeing with it doesn't mean that's faith because even Satan knows it happened. Can't disagree with it. It's the confidence. It's the trust that is the key. And then you say, and I trust that. I have confidence in that. There. Now we're talking faith. And when we talk about fiducia cordis, we're saying it's all three with the emphasis on the trusting, the confidence. That's what fiducia cordis is. So faith is not faith until there's the actual, the trust component there, which God gives. God delivers that as well. So it's not something you have to muster up in yourself. God simply gives it. And this is what Pieper's getting at when he talks about the difference between notitia, which is just knowing, and then the assensus, the saying yes to this, and then the true fiducia, or actually believing and, and trusting. So he wraps this up in 430, where we have the difference between knowledge, assent, and confidence. Each one has to be presented, and we need all three of them to be there. So that's the first thing. So it's a real confidence, a real trusting. So that's first. Second one is, he talks about fides specialis. And this doesn't mean special in the way we kind of sometimes use it in our culture nowadays. Yes, fides, fides supporters. If we're teaching this in the congregation, there's never really going to be the question about, okay, what about my, my mentally disabled niece or child or right. whatever? And if you're telling me the intellectual part of it is, is part of faith. To the extent that they can get it. To the extent that they're able to get it. And so this is why um, we'll talk about this next quarter with infant baptism. And our contention is, do babies have fides cordis, fiducia cordis? Yes. So they intellectual assent and confidence, yes, to the extent that they're able. And this is the whole point about educating our children then, so that as their intellect grows, we keep on giving them instruction in the faith to match their growth and their intellect. But the simple trust is enough. That's the, car, that's the core of it. This is also how we resist the whole idea of the age of accountability. Well, until you know, you can't say yes. Well, no, you can. You, you know enough to know that, hey, there's, uh, there's 
claim that's being made on me, and I trust this claim. That's enough. And, and I've heard and used the analogy um, before, and I'd like to know if this is a fair one, you know, that a baby does not know its parent in any cognitive sense, in the sense of it, you know, but yet they have a clear trust that whenever Absolutely. that mother's holding them, they is, know. That, is that the, is that a That's fair exactly analogy? right. Okay. That's exactly right. All right. Fides specialis. What we mean by fides specialis is that you yourself are believing. It's personal. So personal faith. It's not just kind of a generic, yeah, I'm part of this body of Christ. No, you personally believe. And so the specialis is meaning individuated. You. You believe. That's what we mean by specialis here. Um, 432, top of the page. Um, the truth that the Sphidia Specialis, which the Christian appropriates and so becomes certain of the grace of God from the gospel, constitutes the faith which justifies. That is the teaching of Scripture in the true Christian faith. So this faith that I actually have, I'm the one who's doing it. All right, that's pretty straightforward. The next one is more interesting. Fides Actualis. And this is getting at not that it's real, like it's actually there. The actually is active, the activity. This is stressing that faith is active. It does something. It is actively grabbing on. So you have a faith that does something, and it does. But it's not the doing that saves you, but it does this. And we are sometimes a little reticent to talk this way in our Lutheran theology. We're really big on the passivity of faith. God simply gives it, and faith just hangs on. It's all passive, and yet it hangs on. It's actively doing it. It's saying, there's my object, Christ. Grab on, don't let go. It's actively doing it. Now, is your active doing what saves you? No. Of course not. In fact, how are you able to actively hang on? Exactly. Only by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so even your ability to hang on is given you by the Holy Spirit, but you are doing the hanging on. And the way that Peter says this is very nicely done, that you are the one who's doing the believing, not the Holy Spirit. So in other words, the Holy Spirit's not believing. You believe and yet you believe only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the distinction that we make here. And this is the point he makes on 433 with the infant. Even the infant's faith is an act, and this is the idea of de de desiring, seeking, striving, running after Christ. We have this eager thing from we're stretching out the hands toward him. This is what faith does. It actually grabs on and hangs on tight. And so we are the ones who are doing this believing. And it's not something that happens um, only someone else doing it, but we're the ones who are, who are believing. Um, he makes the stress here then, page 437, we're believing in something that happens outside of us, but it's happening inside me that this is going on. 437, the danger of letting go of this kind of active faith. He says, this is maybe about halfway through the last paragraph from 437 before the page break. It would be wrong to place active and passive apprehension in opposition to each other, for faith is both active and passive in the sense indicated. This is the whole point. So faith is passive, God simply gives it, and yet once it's there, it actively hangs on, and you're the one doing the believing. So the Christian can say, I believe in Christ. That's right. How do you do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's all God's work, and yet I'm the one doing the believing. So if faith fails, that's your fault for letting go. All right, good. Anything else there? I'm getting tight on time, but I want to make sure I get through everything here. Good. Um, next point up he makes is that the function of faith and justification, and he uses this phrase, kind of combining a Latin and Greek word on the bottom of 437. He says, faith is a medium leptikon. He likes this phrase a lot. Medium just means the means, and leptikon means receiving. So a receiving means. It's just the, it's the means it takes. It's the taking. And as Greek, lambano kind of means take or receive, kind of both, sort of the same sort of thing. So faith takes and yet receives and gets what God gives, and the Holy Spirit works it, and you're doing it. So the faith is this medium leptikon, totally passive and yet active as well. It's both. All right, good. And let's see, I'll do our thing. We already talked about 441, and Daniel pointed out the concerns there, and I'm cool with that. He rehits the whole things on the Crux Teologorum stuff, page 442. And then he gives us one more word on his list, and he says that we believe in a fides directa. Fides directa. And what he means by that, he talks about on the bottom of 433. The distinction between fides directa and fides reflexa must be carefully observed. All right, so fides directa is going to be in contrast to fides reflexa. And in fact, this is a lot easier to understand if we start with the reflexa part. By reflexa, 
This is coming into the cognate of reflection or thinking about or contemplating. So fides reflexa is the faith of your morning quiet time. Wow, God is so good to me. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? It comes from God. Wow, God is great. And you're thinking about God. You're thinking about your faith. And that's fides reflexa. And the Christian faith has these times when you're actively thinking about God, reflecting on what he's done, and your faith is contemplating God and his giving to you. That's fides reflexa. Are you doing this all day long? No. In fact, what happens when you're just like consumed in your activity, whatever work you're doing, and you're busy cleaning your house, and are you thinking about your faith? Well, you're probably just thinking about getting the scum off the shower floor um, or whatever. Or what about when you're asleep? When you're asleep, are you actively thinking about Jesus the whole time you're asleep? Well, probably not. You know? And there's all kinds of things we can think about in our life when we're not actively thinking. And so the fides reflexa is not always evident. But fides directa is. Fides directa is the simple knowledge that Christ is my Savior and it's always there. That's fides directa as opposed to the fides reflexa. So he makes this pretty clear here. Um, it is this bottom of 4, 4, 444, bottom of the first paragraph. It is a grave error to define faith as the conscious acceptance of the grace of God. It is not the fides reflexa, that's the conscious acceptance, but solely the fides directa, faith grasping the gospel of Christ, which is the medium lapticon of the grace of God. And this is the difference then. So an infant, fides reflexa, no. So what? Fides directa, yeah. The grabbing on, that's there. So the infant already has fides directa, even though the fides reflexa will come later. Now, the last thing Peter talks about in this section before we get to our end of the reading, and we're almost there, is really cool. And he says it just in a short paragraph, but it's really significant for your pastoral ministry in the future. Hear this. The pastor must be so bold, too, that the desire of the anxious sinner for God's grace in Christ is taught as the true faith, and that the natural man cannot desire the grace of God in Christ, but only regard it as foolishness. The pastor may occasionally have to deal with the case where the patient, obstinately patient, we may say, insists on demanding proofs that he has faith. In such an extreme case, a heroic treatment becomes necessary. The patient must be told to cease torturing himself with a question about his faith and simply to accept the grace offered to all sinners. Now, here's the cool thing that's implicit in that. People are saying that simply the desire for the salvation of Christ is faith. And so the person who says to you something like, boy, I really wish I could believe this. I wish I could believe that there was a God who died and rose again for me and gave me forgiveness. That'd be awesome. I'd love to believe that. But that very desire is faith. And you need to look at the person and say, what else are you looking for? God honors this. It's true. Simply receive the reality that he's already accomplished it for you. And that yearning, that's real faith. And so this is important because when people start saying, well, unless I have real faith, I shouldn't go to the Lord's Supper, which is true. Then they start saying, well, how sincere is my faith? Wrong question. Simply say, the very desire for God, that's faith. The very yearning for it, I want what God has to give me, that's faith. Faith is sufficient. This really comes to play in the Lord's Supper. So when someone says, well, you have to have faith to receive the Lord's Supper properly. Well, that's true. Well, how much faith? Simply trust the promise. That's enough. So the person who says, man, my faith is really struggling, but I really want God's forgiveness, get your tail up to the Lord's Supper. You belong. You need to be there. And that's enough. And so that's what faith is. Saving faith is simply the desire for what God gives. All right. We made it. Any other questions? Anything in Peter? Yeah, true. Pre-Calvary, what is the confidence that <coughs> the saints took? Was it just the covenant? The it's the idea? trust in the promise. It's always the trust in the promise. For us, looking back at Calvary, it's the promise that has been accomplished. And we don't see it, but we trust the promise that has been done. And for those who are living before the cross, it's the trust in the promise that will happen. So they're all, we're all trusting in Christ. We're all trusting in what will be accomplished. Some are waiting for it, and some are looking back and remembering what happened. So, yeah, it's always the same. Trust in the promise. Good. Anything else? Have a wonderful weekend.